to me, the most important role of a board member, almost, you know, it's something that's not obvious, is that does the CEO trust you to the point where they can share their deepest vulnerabilities and fears in a way that they don't feel they're going to be judged or demoted or lose their job because of it? Once you can establish that relationship, you end up getting to the heart of the matter much more quickly. The startup investment landscape is changing, and world-class companies are being built outside of Silicon Valley. We find them, talk with them, and discuss the upside of investing in them. Welcome to Upside. Hello, 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 and welcome to the Upside Podcast, the first podcast finding upside outside of Silicon Valley. I'm Jay Klaus, and I'm accompanied by my co-host, Mr. Money No More Mustache himself, Eric Hornung. Mr. Money No More Mustache. That's like a double nickname. I no longer have a mustache. I do have very long hair right now. I mean, it could be no money because I am i don't have any money either. That actually, that nickname changed as I was saying it out loud. I was like, ooh, this is a better way to go about it. Like in your head, you ha- you were saying the word money and you were thinking mustache next and you realized I don't have a mustache. I was going to say something like Mr. Money Guy himself. And then I looked and realized, you know, what a terrible longer- nickname. I know it wasn't great. And then I looked <laughs> and saw that you no longer had the mustache. And I was like, this is better. This is way better. And it happened in real time. Yeah. So I no longer have the mustache and I do have really long hair. I haven't got a haircut since January of 2020. We're recording this in July of 2020. The the lettuce, as they used to call it back in the day, Jay. It, That's what they call that. Yeah. When when the front is so long and you comb it backwards, it's not quite a mullet because it's from the front. So they call it lettuce. So lettuce just means long hair in lax bro terms. Because functionally, it looks kind of mullety. It does. Well, that's because you're looking at it, you know, it's pulled back and uh, you see the little puffs out the back and I got the headphones on. So you're not looking at the whole thing, right? I mean, if I if I gave it a little swoop or something... You'd be like, oh, there's, there's just a lot of hair. It's not a, it's not a mullet situation or a non mullet situation. It's just a lot of hair. I wish you guys could see what I'm looking at right now. It's beautiful, isn't it? Well, the, <laughs> the latest pull down of your bangs isn't, isn't as good. It looks kind of more feathery than I think lettucey. Like to me, it looks kind of like the back of a chicken, like a, like a little tuft of hair, a little poof. Thank you. I take that. I'll, I'll take that. It's, it's much better than my hair. I mean, we've, we've, Talked about that ad nauseum on this show, so I can't speak down on it. But I do miss the mustache. Yeah. Well, I mean, Jay, you only got one life, and my hair in this life is going to be different than your hair in this life. Speaking of only having one life, Eric, exciting announcement here on the pod. We have a new sponsor. I love when we bring on new sponsors that can help the people that listen on this show. As do I. And that sponsor is Ethos Wealth Management. Ethos is a wealth management firm in Cleveland. We won't be doing full ad reads. Instead, you're going to hear some slogan drops for the next few episodes as they have taken a long-term sponsorship of Upside. And that slogan, what you should know about Ethos Wealth Management, is that they are helping people live the one life they have to live the best way that they can. And that is through wealth management. Wealth management, financial planning, and you'll be hearing more about Ethos over the course of the next year. But Jay, today we have someone else on who is in the finance space, the alternatives finance space. That's right. Today we are talking with Will Price, the founder and general partner of Next Frontier Capital. Next Frontier Capital is a venture capital fund headquartered in Bozeman, Montana, with offices in Boulder, Colorado, and Missoula, Montana as well. They seek to lead or co-lead venture investments in the Rocky Mountain industries with high intellectual property values. You know how much I have like a weird obsession with Montana. I love that we finally have a venture capitalist on from there. We've been looking for Bozeman for a while. We got Missoula with a company a while back, but shout out to Samantha who uh, introduced us to Will Price after listening to the show. Samantha, we thank you. We finally got into Bozeman. Eric, we did it. We did it. We are Bozemanites. Is that what they call them? Bozemaners. Bozemanians. Bose, mo, Bose, Bose Manians, Bose Mansions. Could you just be a Bozeman? Like a human? Yeah, Bose men. Bose men and Bose women. Yeah. Next Frontier Capital was founded in 2015. They have $100 million in assets under management, and they've made 25 investments to date in early stage to Series A financings in the Rocky Mountain region. 
It gives me a lot of flashbacks to our conversation with Greg Robinson from 4490 Ventures, who has the Bay Area experience and says, all right, let's go do something more exciting. We'd love to hear your thoughts on this episode as you listen. You can tweet at us, as always, at UpsideFM, or email us, hello at Upside.fm, and we'll get to that interview with Will right after this. This episode of Upside is sponsored by Tresta. Tresta is an app for iPhone and Android that lets you do business calling and texting from anywhere with no hardware, just the smartphone you're already using. Tresta is the best business phone app on the market. Whether you're a founder or freelancer just starting your business or you're already established, growing your network and your business is all about communication. You've got to be available no matter where you are. Tresta offers the call management features that empower you to communicate smarter and more efficiently, like auto attendance, call recording, user groups, and more. And you don't need any special equipment, just the smartphone you're already using. Tresta is easy to configure, so you can set everything up yourself all online. Tresta's virtual phone system makes it easier and more affordable than ever to set up a fully functioning mobile office. It's just $15 per user per month with no contract. So start your free 30-day trial today at www.tresta.com slash upside. That's www.tresta.com slash upside. Will, welcome to the show. Jay and Eric, I really appreciate you having me. Thank you. It's great to have you on. On Upside, we'd like to start with a background of the guest. So can you tell us about the history of Will? Yeah, the history of Will. It's uh, exciting. So I was born on an Air Force base in Germany. My dad was a, a, an Air Force officer. And then I had what I'd call a peripatetic childhood. So I lived in Germany, Ireland, Northern Ireland, Nigeria, the Ivory Coast, Taiwan, Hong Kong, and London, all before I got out of high school. So I, I've learned over my life to fit in quickly in new places to adapt to change, I think, and struggled also at the same time with a sense of my identity. And when people ask me where I'm from, or it's a very difficult, loaded question, as you just have asked. I uh, went to Harvard undergrad and studied East Asian studies and thinking I would focus my career in China, learned Mandarin and went to Nanjing University and then ended up working in Hong Kong and Singapore. And of course, I live in Bozeman, Montana today. So at some point along the way, I realized like maybe the most populated place on the, on the planet is not for me and ended up back in the Bay Area after going to Kellogg Business School at Northwestern and spent 15 years in the Bay Area working in tech, always around kind of commercialization of early stage technology companies, either as a financier or as a venture capitalist or as a CEO of two companies. And for me, like the greatest joy is working with small teams of four to eight people to try to take a product to market, learn how to do that. And that's been really fun. So that's basically been my my professional career. And in 2014, I at 42 had you know what some people would pejoratively call a midlife crisis, where I woke up one day and realized like the barrier wasn't for me, and I was looking for a, a way to live a a more balanced, nature centric, outdoor centric life while still doing exciting, meaningful things. And my family and I moved to Bozeman, Montana in 2014, where we've been happily ensconced for the last six years, and and started Next Frontier Capital six years ago. And I can talk more about the company in, in time, but we're very happy, happily living in Bozeman, Montana now. So that's, that's me in a nutshell. What brought you into tech? You're traveling all over the world. And at some point you went to Kellogg, you said, and what drew you into the tech space? Well, I wish I could say it's because I have a you know tinker's interest in technology and what have you. But really, I think it's, I graduated in Kellogg from 1999 and I went there in 97 and that essentially was the, the beginning and, and the boom of the internet era, where I think as a young person, you're attracted to dynamic growth, to change in how we live and work. And tech to me is really represented those trends of excitement, uh, newness, uh, innovation, excel, you know, crazy growth. And so graduating in 99 with the tech boom going on, and my parents had retired and they were living in, in Singapore at the time, and they moved to Marin County. I, got, I went to the Bay Area. Uh, you know, I guess if you're in Houston, you're probably in oil and gas. Or in New York, you may be in finance. If you're going to be in the Bay Area, you know, tech is really the game of the game. So, for me, I, I think it was, it's just about the potential. You know, zero to you can how you can see things change overnight. And for me, tech was just something that was like this shining light. That was like you know, as a young person, it's just really exciting to be part of. And then as a business person, trying to find your way into tech and like where the value add can be was a little bit more of a challenge. But that that really was the the genesis of it. I think it was just the era and the promise of that era that was just so captivating. Why the venture side versus going out and going after some of that upside on the operation side? So for me, I was not in venture right away. You know, I kind of got into it accidentally. So I, I 
out of Kellogg, I, I did a company called Embark Solutions that was acquired by a portfolio company at Pequot Capital Management. And Pequot, for people who don't remember that name, was the largest hedge fund in the country in 2000 and uh, had made a you know just a real uh, reputation in, in financing growth. And after the, the sale was complete, I was really kind of man without job. And this was 2002, and those are pretty rough years. And so they offered me a job in their ventures team to help them on the West Coast look at deals. For me, I was, it was a combination of a couple of things. One, I'd always been kind of interested in venture, I think intellectually. Two, in 2002, I didn't really have another plan and, and felt like a good place to be. And so I, I spent three years at Pequot Ventures, which was the venture arm. We had about $2 billion under management of Pequot Capital and worked on a variety of exciting companies. And then really was attracted to the Series A stage. And so I joined Humber Winblad Venture Partners, which had been a co-investor with Pequot and a company called Scalant Systems that ultimately I think was acquired by Dell. And I was at uh, Humber Winblad for three years and made general partner there. And then at 35 or 36, I had this crazy idea, which basically was, you know, the people that are most meaningful at the board meetings, when you listen to them, that have the most sage advice and move away from cliches and kind of business school speak to really get into the substance of the challenge, were the operators, the people that had been in the trenches and, and suffered the entrepreneurial journey. And so I, I, I had this insight at 36 that I kind of got my career inverted, like rather than, and there's a big classic debate in venture about, you know, is venture a vocation that's something that you learn coming out of business school over your career or something you do after you've been successful as an operator where you want to both pay it forward and continue to have your, be in the game. And I straddle both sides of that equation and try to work it out. And obviously there's great examples of venture capitalists who met fit both model but for me, particularly in the early stage, I felt like the operator venture capitalist was the one that added the most sage advice to the CEO, was probably most likely to be trusted by that CEO. And whether there was a lot of challenges in the business, you know, the way I kind of think about it is like, if you're a, a traditional business school venture capitalist, a lot of what you do is kind of prescri prescriptive thesis-driven investing, where you come up with a thesis for the business and these trends, it's X, X plus Y equals Z, and, and you kind of make a declarative statement about this is the way the business is going to be. And then when it doesn't map to the thesis, you know, you're kind of like dealing with the surprise, like, geez, it didn't. But if you're an operator, the mentality is more that you have this theory in the moment, but you're, you know, it's subject to change. And like any war plan, when it meets, you know, the, the combat starts, everything goes out the window. And so it's not a question of like, you know, if something's going to go wrong, it's like, when does it go wrong and how do you react to that? And if you're fundamentally a thesis driven investor, when things go wrong, it, you know, questions your thesis, it questions your judgment. And it's a surprise, like that's not what we expected versus I think an operating venture capitalist knows that that was just the, the best guess at the time. And that when you run into trouble, that it's a natural state of startups, that trouble is going to happen. And it's about how you respond to that trouble. And so I, I just started gravitating more to that operator mentality and realizing I didn't have that as an operator. And so in 2008, I before the meltdown, I took a CEO job in one of our portfolio companies, a company at the time was called Widget Box that uh, was rebranded Flight over time. And I spent six years there. They were very challenging, difficult years, but I feel like I really developed an empathy for the entrepreneurial journey in that. And, and really, I think I'm better as a person and as an entrepreneur, as an investor because of it. That company ultimately was acquired by Snapchat. But, you know, so to answer your question, I got into venture almost accidentally, but I think if I was to look for people to become successful venture capitalists, I do subscribe to that operator venture capital perspective, which, you know, I think it's, it depends on the stage, of course, but if you're doing early stage, I think it's imperative that you have some of that experience. One of the things that's attractive to me about venture capital as an entrepreneur is the idea that you can kind of jump in and see a lot of different businesses and kind of, you know, spend your time thinking about different things. Whereas as an entrepreneur, you're really just mired in the challenges of the day for your business. Did you miss that when you jumped into that operating role? Yeah, I, I did. I, I think if you're if you're someone who loves to learn and listen and uh, study, you know, human beings, markets, uh, venture capital is an incredible job because, as you described, and like you look at like guy like Dick Kramlick who you know ran NEA for years, like you know he was there when before PCs, uh, you know, mainframes, then to PCs, then the client server, then the internet, and then the Internet of Things and mobile. And there's all these waves of technology that come, and you're constantly reinventing yourself. And I, I kind of describe it as like the difference between being an NFL running back and a and a golfer. Like an NFL running back will have a great career for three to five years. They dominate the sport and then they're done. And a venture capitalist, you know, you can play on the PGA Tour, then go on the Masters Tour. I mean, your skill set is evergreen in some sense. And as long as you can continue to connect with LPs and entrepreneurs, you can continue to play it for a long time. 
the other thing I really took away from it is that a lot of people aspire to entrepreneurship, maybe out of the need to want to have that experience. And a lot of business schools now are teaching entrepreneurship. And the thing I've come to realize about entrepreneurship is it really is something that has to be fundamentally mission and passion driven. It's such a difficult thing to do to create a company to convince people to work for you that if you're not inspired by the sense of purpose or mission, it becomes an exercise in pain and suffering. And when you suffer and you don't have this inspiration to continue to persevere through it, you end up doing it out of feelings like guilt, responsibility, obligation, which are really negative motivations, obligations to your employees, to your investors, as opposed to thinking that, well, the world deserves to have this thing, and that without it, the world would be a lesser place. And so my takeaway from my entrepreneurial journey was, was really that I think fewer people should be entrepreneurs rather than more. And there's two things about entrepreneurship. One, the power law of outcomes that we've all kind of come to appreciate through Mark Andreessen and his writings, which is like, it's a winner-take-all market typically. And so the risk returns are, are not awesome. And the second thing is, unless you're really doing it for the right reasons, where you're aligned with your sense of purpose, your mission, your destiny, it can become just overly painful and it's hard to persevere through that. So, you know, the people that we look for, that we want to finance, really, we're looking for that sense of purpose, that sense of mission. What's the founding origin story? You know, why are someone, why is someone working on this? You know, is it deeply meaningful to them as opposed to, you know, a checkbox on a resume or a journey in life? You mentioned this classic debate on operating experience and venture capital. Another kind of question or hot topic in the VC entrepreneur, at least Twitter debates, is what makes a great board member or board observer? And how do you weigh the perspective of yourself as a operations and founder guy versus you as a venture capitalist? Well, I'm going to use a a strange word. I think intimacy is really important. And and intimacy comes from being able to express vulnerability. And so if you can imagine a conversation where you ask someone how things are going and they go, it's going really well, we're killing it, which is a typical kind of response from an entrepreneur. If you can pe- push past that and be like, well, that's interesting, but you know, where I'm having some really difficult times right now and you know, in the X, Y, or Z part of my life, it allows them to then share their vulnerability without judgment. And so to me, the most important role of a board member, almost you know, it's something that's not obvious, is that does the CEO trust you to the point where they can share their deepest vulnerabilities and fears in a way that they don't feel they're going to be judged or demoted or lose their job because of it? Once you can establish that relationship, you end up getting to the heart of the matter much more quickly. In an environment where the board doesn't have trust or people don't trust one another, you end up often seeing board presentations that are about basically positioning and it kind of like they're managing the message in a way that everyone feels like everything's going really well. I think you've got to get past that and be like, look, we totally understand that this is a high-risk startup. There are going to be a lot of setbacks and challenges. It's the speed by which we react to those challenges that will guarantee our success. So we all have to get to a position where we trust one another to be able to share true vulnerability and, and challenge. And in, those, in that sharing of vulnerability, the right answers and the solutions start coming independent of judgment. And so what I try to establish with our CEOs and, and boards that we work with is, is that level of intimacy and trust and you know what you aspire to, I think, as a as a board member, is that like 9 p.m. Friday call, you know, where the CEO is driving home and they're just wrestling with some really, you know, whether the VP sales isn't working out or, you know, a partner just announced a competitive product or their number one competitor just raised 50 million dollars. Whatever whatever the challenge of the day is, I, I think that's the call you want. And then the board meetings, I've kind of come to realize, are almost exercises in creating social capital because if you see things start to frame what ha- ends up happening is people interpret an email or a text or someone's statement in the worst way. And it's, it, it all of a sudden, you know, you go from a, a coalition to a fragmented set of constituencies that are misunderstanding one another fundamentally. It's almost like that book, Normal People. I don't know if you've read that. It's in a Hulu episode, but it, this series is all about how little miscommunications can then transpire into massive challenges. So for me, like a lot of times, board meetings are about reestablishing connection, rebuilding up the social capital, the human capital reserve, if you will, so that when you do earn a challenge, you have a lot of goodwill to draw down on to avoid dysfunction. So to me, there's a lot of expertise you can bring to a board, like I'm good at finance, sales, marketing, all those things. But the underlying tissue that connects people together can fray very quickly under duress people aren't their best selves in stressful situations. And so if you can not assume the worst of people, have pre-established relationships of trust and integrity, then when you hit those rocks, 
as you're flowing down the river, you know, you don't see the fraying to the point where you end up with the, the dysfunction that you read about too often. If you're looking to experience that vulnerability with the CEOs, the companies you invest in, how much of that is something that you expect that you can cultivate over time versus is a filter when you're going through the diligence process? Yeah, a great question. I assume that I can develop it. I mean, I, I think that there's certainly things you're looking for the diligence process, which are like, you know, I, I kind of often joke that the number one predictor of someone losing their job as a CEO is, is not being able to listen effectively. And people who listen well, a lot of times what ends up happening in a board dynamic is someone will, as a board member will make a comment that may not be factually accurate either about the product, an acronym they're using, or some number they're trying to recall. And so the CEO will focus on the, the, basically the inconsistency of that comment and the fact that it's not technically accurate versus the substance of the message they're trying to convey. And so you end up seeing these board dynamics where CEOs are defensive, they're challenging people's comments really quickly and pointing to some specific inaccuracy in their comment rather than the substance of the message. And so what I try to tell a CEO is like, look, you've got you know, people around the board that have years of experience and they're pattern matching constantly, they're doing their best to articulate in the moment what they feel strongly about. Don't focus on the fact that they don't remember the name of your product or the, the number or the name of the VP of sales. Focus on the fact that they're trying to tell you something meaningful. I think the best way to kind of protect the CEO from losing their job is to make sure that the board feels heard, that their feedback is considered that the CEO will go away and reflect on it and not make a snap decision. They can come back later and say, hey, I really listened to you, Eric or Jay, and you know, I appreciate your perspective, but here's why I think you're wrong. But it, it, it's the day after the, or the week after to have that conversation. And in the moment, it can be really difficult. So I always assume that you can develop you know, intimacy and trust. There are people that aren't great listeners, and that could become out of insecurity. It could come out of overconfidence. But just kind of assume that most people are well-intentioned they're trying to do the best thing for their companies that are under incredible stress and duress, and they may not always be their best selves, but you know, fundamentally, they're good people and try to get to a point where people can listen to one another without prejudging the fact that it's an implicit criticism of their character or their quality, and everyone just wants the best. Now, every now and then, you run into a bad actor, and those are difficult situations, but I'd say 99% of the time, that's not the case. It's just a, it's a question of some weird toxic mix of insecurity pressure, stress that's making people hate, behave badly. And if you can just sustain through that, you can, you can develop the trust that we're, we're talking about. I want to pivot to the fund. When you were raising for the most recent fund, what kind of pushback, if any, did you get when you said, oh yeah, I want to raise this fund, but I want to do it out of Bozeman? So I created the first fund in 2015. Montana venture capital is an oxymoron, like military intelligence, you know? So the first thing you have to get to get a sense of is like, okay, well, who the hell is going to be crazy enough to do this? There's two things that I ran into that are very important to talk about. One is is that regional venture capital has for many years been a pejorative concept. So if you say regional venture capital, you're talking about flyover country. You're basically saying, all right, we're going to take California out. We're going to take Seattle, Washington out. We're going to take Massachusetts out. We're going to take New York out. And if you looked at the history of the venture returns, almost all of them have come from those markets. And so you're basically like, wait, you're going to be in venture capital, a long duration asset class with high volatility, and you're going to take out the top markets and, and invest outside of them? Like, that's crazy. And so one of my early bosses told me, in order to broaden the appeal, you narrow the focus. So narrow the focus, broaden the appeal. So you're talking about niche marketing. You're trying to say basically to some people that, hey, these markets are worthy of capital. They have great entrepreneurs. The psychodemographics are, are in their favor. The people are looking to move out of major cities. This is all pre-COVID. Places like Colorado and Utah have blazed the trail for us. And so what we did when we raised the first fund which was a Montana specific fund, going back to that narrowing the focus and broadening the appeal part is I look for people that had a priori evidence that they were interested and cared about this part of the world. And so for me, that was people that were homeowners here, ranch owners, res you know, resort homeowners who served on nonprofits like the Montana Land Reliance, the Trout Unlimited chapter of Montana, the Nature Conservative chapter of Montana. These are people that not only are putting their time and energy in the state, but are volunteering their time and energy to make the state a better place. And so then it was a question of just getting access to those people. And so for the most part, I just started cold calling board members of these nonprofits. What I found quickly was Montana is a place that engenders great love and affection. And so if you go to someone and say, hey, are you interested in taking a small portion of your net worth, investing in the potential of this state and its future? Most of them would say, yes, I am. And then you've asked them, do you have the time and energy to find those deals, to diligence those deals, to prosecute them, to manage them? They'd say no. And I said, okay, well, basically I'm offering you a financial product, which you can take a minimum of $250,000 of your net worth 
invest in this as a concept, invest in testing, whether the thesis, whether people are going to want to live and work in Montana and build great companies. And if I could get that meaning, the success rate of that, that was extremely high. If I went to a, a foundation or, or an institution, an old investor or a professional money manager, and I said, hey, do you want to invest in Montana? They probably wouldn't let me get past that first comment before they would just hang up or say no. And, and, and the second fund we, was a continuation of the first fund. So the first one was $21 million. We raised that in 2015. We raised $38 million in 2017. And we're currently raising our third fund, which I'm not allowed to talk about based on SEC rules, that this fund is going to be a pan Rockies fund. So we've essentially the strategy that I've kind of come to realize is that venture capitalists will invest anywhere in the country today. And that's new. I mean, Don Valentine used to say, I won't invest outside my area code. So now there's a lot of capital. They're looking for businesses across the country that willing to go on airplanes to do so. But what we've discovered is there's a binary line below which there's no interest and above which there's a lot of interest. And that's somewhere between one to $3 million of trailing ARR. And what, why that's the case is that when you're evaluating a business, let's say it's a thousand miles from your office, you want to normalize your evaluation and the risk of evaluating that based on a set of consistent metrics that you can compare company A to company B. And those metrics tend to be in SaaS, for example, like LTV to CAC and churn ratio and, and things like that, sales rep performance. Well, in order to generate those metrics, you know, you're a real business at that point. You're not a startup. You're not a concept. And so you probably have, like I said, one to three million of trailing revenue, and you've probably raised three to five million to get there. That is our opportunity because what that means is that below that one to three million, let's say your company doing fifty thousand dollars a month, there is a null set of national investors that want to invest in you. And so the pressure for that entrepreneur is, well, how are you going to raise that one to four million to then get to the point where you have metrics that'll become financeable on a national scale? And so we look for companies that aren't angel companies, like where they have a concept. They're in market. They have some product. They're you know ten thousand a month in revenue to seventy five thousand a month in revenue. They're just not yet ready for the big time, but they still have a really cool business that's that's doing that, that that's proven itself, and they need to raise that money to get to the Series A. So in some ways, think of us as like completion capital, sitting a little bit to the right on a time scale of seed and and the early angel, but before the Series A. And it just turns out there's a lot of companies that fit that description. And the second thing about it, I would say, is that Series A's today are not like Series A's of the past, and specifically in the size of the Series A, they're eight to twelve million dollar financings, and the fact that most venture firms now don't syndicate anymore, so they want to take the whole thing. So it's a zero sum business. You either win the deal or you lose the deal. At where we play in the one to five million dollars of capital, none of the seed funds are really big enough to want to take that whole thing down, and so there's a lot more likelihood that there'll be syndication available. So you don't have to be the winner, if you will. You can be a co-investor and, and complete the round. We've done a lot of work, for example, with Matchstick Ventures in, in Boulder. That's a $25 million fund in Boulder, Minneapolis. A lot of these funds are in that 25 to 30 to 10, $15 million level, and they want to write 500000 to $700,000 checks. So if you're raising a $1 to $4 million round, there's a lot to go around. So we've kind of found a place in the market where we're below the national competition we're within a regional set of syndicates that are more likely to, to share versus pig out and try to take the whole thing. And so we try to position ourselves as just a, a partner of choice for, for both either the, the entrepreneur who's looking for a lead, but almost more importantly, for the syndicate that's going to come together where they know that we can be good citizens and help them complete the financing. And, and that's been a very effective market position for us. Talk to me about this trend of most venture capital firms don't syndicate anymore. If you look at Series A's today, it used to be when I started on the business, you know, it was like two-handed deals always. It was like you'd be the lead, you'd sign it up, and then you would work really hard to get the second lead. And that, that would be an equal. You each end up with like 20% of the company. So it was like 40% of the company was being sold in the Series A. And it was a, and then you'd have a board typically of both people would get a board seat. Well, a couple of things have happened, I think, is, you know, entrepreneurs have gotten wise to that dilution game. They're like, why am I selling 40% of my company? at the Series A, and I'd rather sell 20% of my company or 25% of the company. And then two, the funds have gotten so large now that in order to meet their employment goals, you know, the reason that you used to syndicate in the past was you wanted to de-risk the investment. You wanted to have a partner if things went wrong, and you wanted to broaden the shoulders if you were to carry that, you know, yoke over your back. But when you have a $100 million fund, that's really more important. When you have an $800 million fund, that's less important. And so whether it's deployment goals, ownership goals, putting the, the, the entrepreneur focusing on dilution, the market uh, starting in around, I'd say like 2008, 2007, 8, started really changing where the Series A's were no longer syndicated. And the, and the first from, I think well, in many cases, they're always the first with Sequoia. I started seeing them do that where they were like, well, why do we have a partner? 
you know, we don't need a partner. Like we, we have our own judgment. We've looked at lots of deals. We don't need someone to validate our work. Uh, second thing is we've got big enough funds now to take it all. And if, if there's only 25% available in this round, let's get all of it. Like why share it? And so I think as the industry's grown, there's less pressure to make sure you have a, a syndicate partner to help to both, you know, basically credit your work. Yeah, did you do a good job in diligence that I can subscribe to your investment thesis? to have your capital to help make sure you can complete the financing and then be there in, things, in case things go wrong. All three of those are no longer operative concerns of venture capitalists. So now they're like, hey, if there's eight to $12 million, let's just do it. Let's do it ourselves. Why would we let someone else in? And maybe they, there'd be like a little bit of allocation to an entrepreneur you know, who could help them. Or, but there's no longer this kind of two-handed deal mentality of most Series A's. You mentioned that the first fund was Montana only. How long did it take you to get through and meet or identify every potential startup in Montana? And did you make it through that before new ones were being started? Or like, one thing I think about is like the limited deal flow in Montana. If you reviewed a couple hundred deals in a year, where would that, just to walk me through that. You make a very good point, Eric. There's the kind of installed base of companies that at time zero already exist. And that, you know, there's a lot more of those, right? And then there's like the organic rate of new companies being created every year. So we, we the first fund had the benefit of basically being able to turn over every rock and find out everyone was out there. And typically when in Montana, what had happened was people that had either, they couldn't raise venture money. So they either bootstrapped, which, you know, it's great, or they'd take an SBAR and STTR loans from the SBA and become quasi-government contractors that kind of pursued this random walk of research availability of money. And the problem with that strategy is that there's the more that you become a SBI, SBA-funded company, the more likely you are to just chase research for the government. You never develop a customer-centric approach or develop product, if you will. Your product is research. And so those companies were, are difficult to finance because they, they never developed the DNA to serve customers, meet their needs, and be product-oriented. But there was a bunch of companies that are bootstrapped, and so we were able to kind of meet those companies, and we able to we put nine Montana companies in fund one. We had one other one outside of Montana. In the second and third fund, we think there's probably two to three companies, new companies a year that are being created that are eligible for financing. And so that's kind of the absolute sense of of where we think the market is. And you're absolutely right. It's a small market. And that's kind of, there's two things that have kind of led us into Colorado and Utah. One is the fact, as I said earlier, that we believe there's this kind of national, whether it's Chattanooga, Tennessee or Madison, Wisconsin, there's this reality that these companies that are sub 2 million in trailing revenue have this challenge and there's an opportunity there. We picked the Rockies as our, our way of expanding our strategy because we think we can compete effectively in, for, in more states. Of course, it increases the deal flow that's available, but also creates these kind of bilateral syndicate relationships that'll, that allow us to cobble together financing. Like we'll do a deal in Utah, they'll help finance a deal here, or we'll both do work on one in Colorado. But I, I think what, what ends up happening, the, the net result of your very excellent question is the fund sizes have to be of a size that's appropriate for that native rate of new company formation. And so this will never be a $200 million fund. You know, it, it just, at some point there's only this, it's like a sponge that's fully absorbed of water. You can't put more water into it. And that, that's kind of the way I think you design these funds is What's the, the responsible, appropriate size of the fund that is appropriate for the strategy you're trying to pursue? You know, we think it, it's in the tens of millions that that possible, not the hundreds of millions. And so it's a niche strategy, but that's okay for me. I, I enjoy that. Here in Columbus, Drive Capital, which got started a similar time as Fund One of Next Frontier Capital, they've moved a bunch of companies into Columbus and invested in them with them moving here. Have you moved companies into Bozeman or Missoula? Yes, we just Twin Thread is, is a recent example. They're moving to Bozeman this summer. They're, they're, it's a predictive IoT company. What's really changed, I think, and I don't know what the implications of this is COVID. You know, like I just met this morning with a Wilson Sassini partner that's living in Bozeman right now. While, you know, they see through COVID last week, I went mountain bike riding with a guy who works for Apple self driving car unit whose wife works for Airbnb. John Mayer, John Mayer just moved out there. So, John Mayer. In fact, I, I saw last summer I was walking through Livingston and I, I saw a guy smoking on the street. I'm like, oh, that's interesting. I don't, you don't see this guy smoking. And he had like a little European man purse on. And I was like, oh, that's interesting. And I was like, oh, it's Dave Chappelle. You know, Dave Chappelle is walking. And, uh, and then I was like, and there's a homeless guy walking with John, Dave Chappelle. And that's John. And so I said to someone, hey, is that Dave Chappelle? They're like, yeah, and that's John Mayer. I'm like, oh, that's John Mayer. So yeah, John Mayer, he, he gets every now and then he gets seen, but it was fun to see those two guys. 
but my point being is that I think the rules are being rewritten right now, which is that, you know, you know, you take a company like Apple that was always a got to be in the office, no working from home. We're not a distributed company. I don't know if you guys remember Ms. Marissa Mayer when she took over Yahoo, kind of ended the work from home thing and made everyone come back to the headquarters. But, you know, when Zuckerberg says, hey, you know, 75% of Facebook employees are asking to move, you know, Twitter, Square, Stripe, uh, we're all saying we're going to move to a distributed organization. Shopify is ready distributed. I, I think what's going to be fascinating to see what happens next is a lot of people are waking up who are probably great entrepreneurs who are like, either A, let's put some people in Bozeman, or maybe our, one of our co-founders will be in Bozeman or Missoula or Boulder, or let's put our company there. And so to me, that I think that's, that, that I, I don't even know what's going to happen with that. But I think we've kind of gone from like, gee, that's an Achilles heel to be in a backwater to people now in COVID going, well, maybe that's where I want to be too. And I'm not sure, I think they're, you know, a lot of people were questioning, I think, the value proposition of, of extreme urban environments, whether it's taxes, commuting, you know, real estate costs, the, the fight for labor that leads to bidding of salaries. And uh, those are always been traditional knocks against urban environments, but it's always been, yeah, but there's such a, a network effect here that overcomes any of those costs. The pros still outweigh the, the cons. I think that there's a reassessment of pros and cons now where, you know, the con list is getting a little bit longer. So long story short to your question, like, yes, we have moved people here pre-COVID, but I think post-COVID, we're going to see a much more fluid concept of what, of what a company is, the, you know, no headquarters, multiple poles, if you will, like multipolar companies where they're spread out everywhere. I think that company markets like ours will be great beneficiaries of it. And I don't even mind if they're not entrepreneurs day zero when they come here, but if these got, you know, great tech 100 executives move here and they're still working for their company, A, it either gives us more fuel to hire them for our businesses, or two, you know, they may be the kind of people that after being here a year or two say, you know what, you know, Stripe just went public. I'm rich now. I'm, I'm going to do my own thing, be either be an angel investor or start a company. So I, I think that, you know, not, not that I wish COVID on anybody, it, it will be a catalyst for change for the acceptance in corporate America, startup America, or conventional America to say, when you say, I live and work in Bozeman, Montana, instead of people going, you're a nutcase, like, why do you do that? They're going to go, I wish I could live in Bozeman, Montana. And that sounds like a really good idea. And that's happened. Like, like I remember moving here, people were like, oh, it's death to your career. Like, do they have shops in Montana? Like, uh, is there an airport there? You know, to um, now people are like, wow, you know, that was, uh, that was a prescient move. And we may not be too far behind you. If one of your companies came to you and said, yes, we're headquartered in Bozeman, but we're going to do a distributed strategy. How do you think about that from a advice perspective, given your answer earlier about building up social capital by meeting in person? I'll give you two examples. One, we were doing a CEO search recently and I met a guy on Zoom. You know, I was thinking to myself, wow, this guy, I don't know. You know, I just can't tell if it's a good fit. Like I really didn't get a sense of who he was on the phone. It was a little stilted, stiff. And then when I met with him in person, I, he was a wonderful person to meet in person. So I, the takeaway there for me was like, you know, Zoom meetings are awesome. If you know somebody, I'm sure you would you and Jay know each other really well. And, you know, getting on a Zoom call is not that difficult for you. But when you're trying to build that relationship, to your point, Eric, you know, I think Zoom does not create the intimacy that fills up the social capital tank. I think you still have to find ways to meet in person. I think it's going to be a challenge. I think what I have seen is, is a, this is anecdotal more, and I don't have a data on this. A lot of companies are not renewing their real estate leases. Let's say they have 10,000 square feet now. They're going to go to 2,000 square feet, have a series of conference rooms for people to be able to meet and go through product plans or planning sessions, but then have a distributed, be a distributed company. Obviously, COVID, you know, in certain states, it's kind of mandating that. Here in Montana, we're, we're open again. But even there, people are still thinking that maybe I don't need an office the way we traditionally thought of an office where everyone has a desk. You know, the concept of hoteling and sharing office space has been around for a while, but I do think it's going to become a reality. My view is, I think it's one thing to be fully distributed. Like I think uh, someone said this the other day, if you're all a Zoom tile, you know, it's different than you being the single Zoom tile and everyone else being around an office table when you're the, the you know, kind of stranger, if you will, outside of the org. I think companies that are go distributed have to really invest hard in making remote workers not feel like second class citizens. What's happened over the last three months is that we've all been remote and we've all realized like, okay, this does work, especially where you have pre-existing relationships. And it, we can be productive and we effective. And I think there'll be a greater mindfulness of, of even if we go back to some people being in the office, some people being remote. Like what, one of the things we've done, for example, for our partner meeting, if we're all going to do it on Zoom, even though some of us are in the office, we all take it from our individual offices. So we're all Zoom tiles, you know, versus like, you know, three of us around a table and then other people off. Because it just, if you're on the same page, 
it doesn't feel weird. But if you're the odd man out being like, hey, I can't really hear you guys. Can you get closer to the mic? <laughs> you know, whatever the you know, the conference call drama is. So I think we're about to go in uncharted territory, but I really feel like for us, it's going to be a, a catalyst to our business because whether it's Utah, Colorado, Idaho, Montana, Wyoming, you know, we continue to see massive interest in people relocating and it's fuel for talent for our companies and also hopefully be fuel for new ideas that get, that get created. With the oxymoron of regional venture capital still being a fairly new experiment, if this really does catalyze much more distributed teams and your mandate to LPs is to invest in Montana, does this broaden the scope of who you can invest in? Does this make that more difficult? Like, what does that mean for the regional venture capital thesis? Yeah, I mean, for us, I think it makes it easier. I mean, like, you know, like let's say, for example, we have, like, for me, the company doesn't have to be, a, uh, you know, headquartered in Montana or, you know, as long, they need to have at, people on the ground. This needs to be like, and so if there if there's a nexus of people that are here, I think it increases the, the, the pie of companies that are eligible, of course, because they've got key employees here or in our region. So I, I think honestly, like I would say from a startup perspective and a funding perspective, like it's going to create a lot of opportunity where the real challenge for someone like us is, is like church LPs, big LPs, endowment foundations as a rule want to make 25 million to hundred million dollar LP commitments. And the reason for that is the work they do for a $5 million commitment is the same work they do for a $75 million commitment. And the overhead of all of these managers becomes difficult. So the trend in venture capital right now is reduce the number of managers that you're working with, increase your allocation to those managers. And that's leading to bigger and bigger funds because few, you know LPs want to give fewer people more money. They all recognize that emerging managers historically have outperformed the venture index. They're recognizing to some degree that there are these regional economies that are emerging that, like like you said, Utah, that may be worthy of more capital than they're receiving. But what's broken in the industry is that they don't have a product to allocate capital there. And histor- historically, fund the funds have played that role. Like they'll take $100 million from a big LP and then split it up into you know, $25 million allocations. But even the fund of funds now don't really have an emerging manager practice in the regional venture capital space. So the biggest challenge to someone like myself is that how do you raise money Historically, most venture funds are funded by endowment foundations, pension funds, and et cetera. Those pension funds have gotten larger and larger. Their minimum LP commitments are creeping up. And typically, they don't want to be more than 10% of a fund. So the math is pretty simple. If your minimum LP commitment is $50 million and you want to be 10% of a fund, it's a $5 million fund. We're trying to raise you know, tens of millions of dollars. And so it, it really creates this terrible dynamic where, for me, I feel really fundamentally like you guys, that like capital has been exclusive. It's been exclusive to a few numbers of states. It has not been e- evenly distributed to opportunity, and it's created this bifurcation in our country where there are certain economies that feel like they have, they're have they tied to the economic engine of innovation and wealth creation, and other parts of our country that feel adrift from that and resentful, frankly, of that. And you're seeing it in the Rust Belt, you're seeing it in the Southeast, you're seeing it in the Midwest, you're seeing it in the Rocky Mountains. And I do think there's been some fundamental societal implications of that, which is like, hey, if you're a software developer in the coast, you, you know, you're making hundreds of thousands of dollars. If, you know, if you're living in... in you know, Columbus or Bozeman, it's not as easy to tap into that wealth machine. And I think there are political implications for that. I think there's income inequality implications for that. There there are a lot of other things that come out of it. So for me, fundamentally, I believe that capital should be more evenly distributed. And yet, where the capital is pooled right now, there's not an efficient way to allocate capital in small chunks to the markets and the managers that are going to drive returns in the future and create a more evenly distributed set of prosperity in our country. And it's very frustrating because everyone says they want to support diversity. Geographic diversity is important as well as, you know, other types of diversity. And yet there's no, I don't think, LP commitment to do that, that I can see or discern in a meaningful way to find ways to allocate emerging managers, whether they're, you know, of people of color working in in remote regions. And so I think the big challenge for the LP community is that the way it's set up right now, it's a winner's game. The Bigger funds are getting bigger and bigger allocations. They're growing larger and larger, and that's obviously, you know, evidently true. And yet, there's a lot of people in the country that are left behind because of their emphasis on writing bigger checks. When the market, you know, some of these funds maybe 10 million, maybe 20 million, maybe 30 million. And so the answer historically has been you find high net worth people, family offices that are willing to support these emerging managers and write smaller checks to create these funds. But I do think ultimately the the kind of economic potential of our country is limited by the fact that institutional LPs don't have a meaningful way to allocate to these regional entrepreneurs. And because that 
that of dislocation or the lack of ability to do so. I think we're leaving a lot of money on the table and leaving a lot of companies underfunded or entrepreneurs undiscovered. And so I really would love to see a product emerge where there are more fund to funds that are tied to that regional thesis. I think, for example, if you came up with a product that I want to raise $200 million and I want to put you know, $10 million in 20 funds, the best fund in Columbus, you know, the best fund in Chattanooga, the best fund in Madison, the best fund in Phoenix, I think that'd be a great product. I think there'd be a lot of family offices and institutions that would want that because it solves that translation exercise for them. They can still write a large check, but then they don't have to deal with the underlying small checks that have to be allocated out. So to me, I think the regional venture thesis is, is, is a great one, but yet there's not an institutional way for them to participate in a meaningful way, which I think is disappointing. You have this concept of VCs as either asset pickers or asset managers. Can you explain what that is and describe where Next Frontier sits on that scale? I think the simple way to think about it would just be like, does value get created at the moment of investment and your ability to, to successfully pick the greatest possible investment based on the merits of the, of the time? Or can you make almost investment in, largely in anything and then steward and nurture it to, to a great outcome? You know, I, I think that, I think the answer is, it's a complicated one, of course, but I think it's really hard to pick bad markets and make good outcomes. And so I think if you, you know, if you're in a good market, you may not pick the right instance of an idea, but you, you know, you can evolve over time to something meaningful. Like what are some bad markets? Like, you know, traditionally ad tech's been a very, very difficult market to make money. We have basically two monopolies that control the, the economy around advertising with Amazon still entering the market. And so like, if you look at the net dollars available of growth, I think like 90% of them go to Facebook and Google, right? So that's a bad market. So you could pick the best team possible and they're just in a tough market. You, you know, you think about markets that are much more open, less controlled by an incumbent that are growing quickly. I think SaaS, vertical SaaS is a great example of that, where it just, it, there's, a, there's a massive adoption of these technologies. There's a lot of workflow products for verticals where Salesforce doesn't really care about them necessarily, but you know, people are moving from client server to SaaS. And so to me, I, I, you know, Warren Buffett says the market bats last. And one of the things I really come to learn is that the margin for error in a high growth market with a lack of incumbent control and relatively few gatekeepers to the consumer can lead to great outcomes. And you could mispick the idea, but you can recover because the market's great. But if, and so I to kind of add a third lens, I guess, to your question and just say, to me, it's all about the market dynamics and the ability for net new companies to emerge successfully in those markets. And then you can course correct within them because the markets are growing so quickly. In a shrinking market, you know, the best team is still bailing water and will probably sink. Well, this has been awesome, Will. If people want to learn more about you or the work that you're doing at Next Frontier Capital, where should they go after the show? Well, we have a website, nextfrontier.com. My email is will at nextfrontiercapital.com. I'd certainly welcome any follow-up. Uh, I'm on Twitter at Price W, and I'm a big champion of, of regional venture capital. I'm on the MVC board right now, and I spend a lot of time and energy trying to make sure that regional markets are represented by the institutions and the organizations that make this industry a great one. And I think that we're in the early innings of, of greater acceptance of our importance, because I do think we'll be financing some of the great companies tomorrow and helping these economies and these, and these, or, these cities and towns Retap into the wealth creation that's been really limited to the coasts and, and hopefully shrinking income inequality in our country while doing so. Hey, listener, have you ever wanted to get a message in front of the upside audience but weren't sure how to sponsor the show or weren't able to do a long term sponsorship? Well, now you can just go to upside.fm slash classifieds and let our audience know anything that's going on in your world, whether it's an event, an application, a special coupon or deal, or just letting them know who you are, what your company does. All you have to do is go to upside.fm slash classifieds and you can place an ad on this show. That's upside.fm slash classifieds. All right, Jay, we just spoke with Will from Next Frontier Capital. Did you feel the, uh, the Montana vibes? What are Montana vibes? What would that feel like? Uh, big. Big. Spacious. Spacious. Relaxed. Like it takes a long time to get from one vibe to the next. I felt very calm through the interview, which I would credit to Will's demeanor. And if that is a Montana vibe, then I felt it. All right, cool. Well, then this interview did its job. Before we 
talk about Will and Next Frontier Capital, uh, got to let the listeners know that before we started recording this segment, Eric's back talking about dyeing his hair blonde. <laughs> I am. Yeah. Okay. Let's not take away from Will here. Yes, I'm talking about dyeing my hair blonde. If you think it's a good idea, send me a tweet at EK Hornung. If you think it's a bad idea, send Jay a tweet at Jay Klaus. I don't want that negative energy. I want you to tweet at me if you think it's a what did you say? If you think it's a good idea, tweet at J. Klaus. No, bad idea, J. Klaus. Good idea, E.K. Hornung. All right, all right, all right. Tag upside in both. All right, all right. So, Will, his story, which I didn't expect, began in Germany. Yeah, people have stories that begin in different countries. Lived all over the world. Germany, Ireland, Nigeria, Taiwan, Hong Kong, London. Went to the Kellogg Business School and spent 15 years then in the Bay Area working in tech. That is a winding road to land in the valley and spend quite a bit of time in the valley. But after a midlife crisis, realized that wasn't where he wanted to be and moved to Montana to start Next Frontier Capital. Eric, that happened about the same time. You know, you mentioned in the intro, reminded you a little bit of Greg Robinson. Happened about the same time that we saw some of these valley investors move to different areas of the country, including Greg Robinson in Wisconsin and the team at Drive Capital moving to Ohio. All of that seemed to be happening kind of concurrently, a small cohort of investors that most of their peers thought they were crazy. And I guess that thesis is still to be played out. They probably look a lot smarter here in 2020 than they did in 2015. But you wonder how much is the chicken before the egg? Is that the phrase? Egg before the chicken? Chicken? I forget the phrase. Like, is it because they moved there that those regions are now better? Or is it because those regions were getting better that when they move there now it looks better? You know, it's like, were they the catalyst or were they the benefactor? What do you think about these very specific regionally focused funds, Eric? I think that they will have their place for the next decade or so, the next few kind of turns of new fund creation. My specific take is that eventually it will be harder to compete on just geography unless you really niche down. But to have to own all of Montana probably isn't as possible five years from now as it was five years ago. Yeah, I agree, because as we're seeing right now in the midst of a pandemic, the world is becoming just more remote, distributed, location independent. And so, you know, what I think the key insight here was from Will was that was a compelling pitch to get people to invest in this fund in that region, because, of course, we want to help the prosperity of our region. And that makes a lot of sense to me. And if that's the way that these funds get started and that's the way that people start opening their checkbooks and funding startup companies, uh, I love that. But I agree that long term, it feels like it's, it's a tough position to defend. And honestly, it just feels like, you know, you brought up the question of deal flow for a regional fund. It seems like you're going to see most or all of those companies very quickly. Yeah. And it comes down to how many new companies can be created in that region. I mean, right now we're looking at launching a network of podcasts for Upside and you have to have deal flow for the podcast as well. So when we look at Cleveland, can that support 52 episodes per year? That's a question we have to answer. It's the same question that a venture capitalist has to answer, except with a venture capitalist, if they look at 52 companies in a year, they're only maybe investing in one of those, maybe two. So it's a little easier for a podcast, but it's still the same thing is what is the what is the total number of things that I can look at? And if I run through those too quickly and there's not new ones being created, what happens to my thesis? One of the questions that I want to get your take on here, Jay, because I have an opinion, but I don't actually know your opinion on this. We talked about the long time debate in venture capital that board members should or should not or need or needn't not. Needn't is a fun word. Needn't not. Needn't is actually a contraction of need not. So you're saying need need not not. I am. Yeah, I'm double negativing with a bunch of alliteration. Very fun. Look, linguistics on the podcast. Anyway, the operator versus non-operator VC debate. Where do you stand on this? Well, I'm an operator, so I'm biased towards operators. However, I think that most companies, pretty much all startup companies, are doing something very novel or they wouldn't be a startup company. And so the danger that I think an operator like me would have on a board is 
What you don't want on your board is someone who is overconfident that they know the answers because they've seen something like it in the past in a novel situation. And so for an operator on the board, you would want that person to, sure, I think have some experience close to the problem. I think that's valuable. But you also need them to be humble enough to recognize how that experience may not perfectly map to what you're doing and not be prescriptive in their advice. So if you had a a balanced, humble operator, former operator on your board, I think that's ideal because they can have some real experience to relate to it. But because it is new, I think they have to realize that that may not actually be totally valid here. And we're going to trust you, founder, to figure out what to do with this data we're giving you and make the best decision you can for your business. I've been thinking about this a lot lately, and I've kind of developed this little theory in my head that investors who are also operators tend to be good enough most of the time. Like 90% of investors who are also operators and have operating experience, you know, they, they're going to be, if you rated every investor in the world from 99th percentile to 0th percentile, operating investors are going to tend to cluster in that 40 to 80 range, like just naturally because they have that operating experience. And I think purely financial investors, ones who don't have operating experience, they don't have like that natural foundation to where they can step in and just be good originally, but they do have a competitive advantage in their ability to focus on investment returns. So they can be either the best in the world or value dilutive by being involved. So there's more volatility with a financial investor versus a operating investor is my new theory. That's what I'm thinking about right now. I also think a potential risk of an operator on your board is that they might get too concerned with the details. You and I see this in our dynamic all the time where you have an idea and it's a great idea and it makes a lot of sense. And I'm just like thinking through step by step what's going to take to make that real. And I get too sidetracked with, well, that sounds like a bunch of work. (laughs) And on your board, you don't necessarily want somebody who's getting really caught up in the details and especially how you are going to walk through the execution of something. You want someone to buy into the vision, help set the vision and help clear the course. But again, if that operator is humble enough to recognize that and not do that, I think that's great. I like the concept from Next Frontier that they are market pickers. I like when venture capitalists lay out very explicitly what matters most to them. You know, there's the old dynamic of team, product, or market. And a lot of people will go team first. Some people, especially in the high R&D areas, will go product first and like progress first. And then we've heard now from Drive Capital and Next Frontier that they are market first. They lead with making sure the market is big enough, making sure they are, it's hard to pick bad markets and make good customers was a quote that he said. I like that or make good outcomes. So I like that there's some transparency around market comes first here. I also liked his perspective on vulnerability with founders to their investors and his confidence that you can cultivate that relationship with a founder over time, which supports that market picking stance. You know, he's saying we pick markets, we think we can develop strong relationships with and help guide our founders. I like that too. Yeah, it all seemed like a fairly cohesive string of logic there. I just enjoyed this interview in general. And the best part about this interview, Jay, was that after the interview, we got promised that if we go make it out to Montana, we get to go fly fishing. He's going to take us fly fishing. There we go. And a little public accountability here on the pod. Love it. Let's <laughs> cash those chips in, my friend. We'd love to hear your thoughts on this episode. Please tweet at us at Upside FM or email us hello at Upside.fm. We are now Bozeman. And if there are companies in Bozeman that we should talk to, either Bozeman or Bozewomen, please let us know. You can tweet at us at UpsideFM or email us hello at Upside.fm. We'll talk to you next week. That's all for this week. Thanks for listening. We'd love to hear your thoughts on today's guest. So shoot us an email at hello at Upside.fm or find us on Twitter at UpsideFM. We'll be back here next week at the same time talking to another founder in our quest to find Upside outside of Silicon Valley. If you or someone you know would make a good guest for our show, please email us or find us on Twitter and let us know. And if you love our show, please leave us a review on iTunes. That goes a long way in helping us spread the word and continue to help bring high quality guests to the show. Eric and I decided there were a couple things we wanted to share with you at the end of the podcast. And so here we go. 
Eric Hornung and Jay Klaus are the founding parties of the Upside Podcast. At the time of this recording, we do not own equity or other financial interest in the companies which appear on this show. All opinions expressed by podcast participants are solely their own opinion and do not reflect the opinions of Duff and Phelps LLC and its affiliates, Unreal Collective LLC and its affiliates, or any entity which employ us. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as a basis for investment decisions. We have not considered your specific financial situation nor provided any investment advice on this show. Thanks for listening and we'll talk to you next week.